Hey guys, and welcome to episode 48 from a pretty cold South Africa. It's definitely one of the coldest nights so far. Uh, I wonder if I can see the temperature. Um, but yeah, it's definitely pretty cold. Um, also, there are not going to be too many special effects. I'm not going to play any video, any sound. Uh, we're going to go into the letters, uh, and we're going to really sort of stew in the whole Van Gogh thing. Um, we are going to look at two other sort of elements, which is why are some people happy and why are some people not happy, right? And with that, in that regard, we're going to look at this article, why are Norwegians amongst the happiest people in the world? Think about that. And then we're also going to look at this article from the New York Times, how to feel alive again. It's also about how do you um, approach the idea of happiness? And we, we're going to kind of do that within the context of what is going to happen now, which is Van Gogh's unraveling happiness, his, his, his slow descent basically to death. And, and so what lessons can we learn from that? Um, and also, what is the difference between Van Gogh and Gauguin that that um, that that led to unhappiness between the two of them? So it's not just your personal happiness, but sharing space leading to unhappiness. Uh, good to see uh, Stephanie and Sharon and Mel and Gloria. Uh, good to see you all. Um, I just want to see if I can uh, put the image in the background, in the foreground, uh, because I want to just briefly talk about that. So this, uh, let's do it like so. So, so um, one of you commented on how good that background does look, Gloria. And Gloria, you're absolutely right. Um, this this uh this was painted in spring right this was painted in spring but do you know what the difference is this was painted in the spring of 1889 so can you see just what a radical curve just how incredibly his art has improved over basically a period of a year right this is a beautiful painting i wouldn't mind having this picture in my home um, I'm not 100% sure if this is all. I suspect it may be Sahami. Uh, it looks slightly different to all as well. Um, but this is what what a difference a year makes. And, and I suppose you could say the influence of Paul Gauguin, right? Um, that he may have had some kind of uh, positive impact as well, not just all negative. Uh, do I have another picture I can share with you? Um, it's cheating a little bit because we're going into the future, but I just want to show you uh, the difference a year makes, right? And that is the postman, and we're going to actually look at uh, other paintings he makes kind of now of the postman. And don't you agree that's also an excellent picture? We're starting to get that rich sense of Van Gogh as a as a truly accomplished artist, right? And I must say, when you when you look at this um, picture, this portrait, and you also look at that one, you start to wonder how didn't he sell this art? This is really gorgeous. This is really quite something, right? And I think again, part of the answer is what was going on in the background, what society was thinking of him what uh, he was doing when he wasn't painting. That's the other side of the, that story. So we are going to come back to this whole idea of um, uh, happiness, right? Kind of just as a general idea. But within the context of Vincent van Gogh in his time and, and uh, Gauguin in, 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 his, ta in his time. Uh, the other thing to note is did you guys know that yesterday was the day, so the 31st of March, 1889, was the, the day that the Eiffel Tower was sort of officially opened and then the World Fair as well. Did you guys know that? 
So not quite sure how many years it, it is. Is it um, is it 144 years or um, what is it? 34 years. Um, so we just think it's 23. Yeah, I think it's about 134 years ago. So yesterday, yesterday, 134 years ago, if my maths is right, the Eiffel Tower was officially sort of used uh, to inaugurate the World Fair in Paris. So it gives you a sense of also what what we are marching towards in terms of our timeline. And funny enough, I um, I heard that on the radio. I was just like driving and, and I said, uh, on this day, blah, blah, blah. And then they went through a couple of things and one of them was that. And I was like, wow, okay. I, I didn't actually even know that. Thank you. I'll, I'll tell my, I'll tell my, um, my audience that. So there we go. Uh, yeah, okay. So that's today. Uh, for me, it's no longer today for the past almost three hours. Okay. Okay, so are you guys ready to get get cracking? Let's go. So we're in July, and um, yeah, we're going to kind of deal with, I think it's the next letter that Gauguin says, I'm coming, it's, it's happening, um, and, and everything that follows, okay. Um, okay, 7 July 1888, my dear Theo, if we take a whole length of ordinary canvas, this is the net price. I've just found it out by chance. Ordinary rough yellow canvas with two yards. And then he says that's what the discount is. So here's an opportunity to check Tessé's prices, and he goes through all of that. And then he says, <coughs> I'm not going to really go through all of that uh, it's basically just talking about the cost of art material. And then he says, do you remember among the little drawings, a wooden bridge with a washing place and a view of the town in the distance? I've just painted that subject in a large size. So that was a drawing he did, right? This drawing. And now he has executed it as a painting. Uh, don't and now again compare what you see on screen to the picture behind me. Can you see how much has evolved just in less than twelve months as an artist? The, what you're seeing on screen is so so, even maybe below average. It's not terribly good, right? Then he says, I must warn you that everyone will think that I work too fast. Can you see that that is starting to become a regular refrain now? He's saying uh, that quite often. And um, if you're paying attention, you can start to get the sense that the Van Gogh that you've always known or thought you knew, certainly through his paintings, that Van Gogh is starting to come forward right now. Is becoming recognizably Van Gogh in terms of that identity, right? Anyway, he says to Thea, don't you believe a word of it? Um, it is not emotion, the sincerity of one's feeling for nature that draws us. Oh, is it not emotion? I was going to say, I, was, I thought that it is emotion. So he says, um, the reason he's painting so fast is almost as a representation of emotion. And that's why, if you really want to uh, understand Van Gogh's art, the, the style of it, the thick, the, the impasto, the thickness of the art, and to some extent, the busyness of it, you can, you can uh, intuit that just through emotion and motion. That's really what he's, he infuses his art with. And... So that is in terms of the style, but then also the color. The color is also trying to show um, emotion, some to some extent symbolism, which is kind of the same thing. Okay. So he goes on to say, um, 
the, the sincerity of one's feeling for nature that draws us and if the emotions are sometimes so strong that one works without knowing one works so that's a very good sign it shows that he is starting to get into the zone I, i've also had it with writing where you uh honestly you you wake up in the morning walk to your computer just want to check a few emails when you this is like morning you know the sun has come up and then when you look again you haven't eaten all day and it's almost like the next morning of the next day and the birds are starting to sing and you've just been caught up in one long rush of um uh yeah inspiration but yeah you've been so immersed in your subject matter that that it's felt effortless and the only reason you stop is because your body literally cannot take anymore your mind is running the whole show right and so that's what's happening with him he says when sometimes the strokes come with a continuity and a coherence like words in a speech or a letter so it's the exact same thing where you, you write uh you you in like a rhythm um it's almost like someone else is dictating and you're just trying to keep up with that um he's uh experiencing the sense of flow and uh it, it's good for his confidence but of course he's nowhere near where he can be or should be i mean if he's experiencing flow when he's painting this garbage sorry to be frank but th that's nice but uh what we really want to see is flow taking him somewhere worthwhile uh, which which is not it's not doing uh kind of consistently but we, we're about to get there so then he says um one must remember that it has not always been so so he's saying you shouldn't take that <coughs> um is it moment you shouldn't take that uh phase for granted and then he says and in time to come there will be again hard days empty of inspiration so he's talking about i guess painter's block in a sense just that that ebb and flow where you find your groove and then you sort of lose your groove so one must strike while the iron is hot so it's almost like saying it's almost like he gets this rush of life and then he paints while he feels it and tries to capture that because if that sensation leaves him then it's like it's almost like the drug wears off what am i going to do so can you see that's that's kind of how it's taking over over him and for an artist that's really good but it's it's not necessarily that good for a human being to escape from reality or to not be dealing with reality too often right this is what makes a great artist but it's also the road to can be the road to psychological ruin if you're not dealing with the real world and you end up um living in fairy tales more than reality th then you're not going to be very good at dealing with reality and isn't that where van gogh finds himself at the end of the year where reality hits him like a pile of bricks right and so that's also what you want to look at how does he not deal with reality increasingly between now and then he says i've not yet done half the 50 canvases fit to be shown in public and i must do them all this year so that's that's his ambition is communicated a few times uh i know before and that they will be criticized as hasty so he's repeating that same thing I know also that I hope to stick to my argument of this winter when we were talking about an association of artists. Not that I still have any great desire for it or hope to realize it, but as it was seriously thought out, it is our duty to go and taking it seriously and to retain the right to come back to the question. So can you see uh, there's a little bit of a, a measuredness to his enthusiasm. Um, can you see that? He's... A little humbled already there's a little bit of humility coming through that that wasn't really present before and then if gorgan won't come to work with me then i have no other means than my work to set against my expenses so you kind of get the idea that um in a way van gogh is trying to lean on gorgan you know in terms of his 
because uh, he's a more accomplished artist, um, lean on him in a way and also get a bit of borrowed credibility. And um, that's not, uh, you know, like w when I started off writing books, especially for the American market, I'm not ashamed to say that I sort of did the same thing with Lisa Wilson. I sort of, I mean, I, ne I really needed Lisa, besides that we got along really well and we um, uh, had in any way complementary approaches. Um, I needed to know what, what was ticking, you know, in the American market in terms of true crime cases. And so, so, and, and besides that, it was also, I think it would help to have an American voice and an American partner in this kind of enterprise. Can, can you see the, uh, that, that aspect? Now, I think something like that was going on with um, Van Gogh and Gauguin, uh, right? Um, he, um, he's the amateur in the equation. He's the he's got a lot to learn kind of thing. Um, what, I can, what I can say about my partnership with Lisa is it certainly lasted longer than the two months that, that Gauguin and Van Gogh did their thing. Um, but I think it's a similar, he's coming, he is coming into this with a similar realization that his capacities, his um, understanding of the art market from a sales perspective of is pretty good from being an art dealer, but from a painter's perspective, that's maybe we lack something. And maybe even he's not a Frenchman, whereas um, Gauguin, uh, actually not sure if he was Danish. I think he had a Danish wife. Let me just make absolutely sure. It's actually quite embarrassing that I don't know that. Um, yeah, okay, so he is a French artist, but I just thought that he was, wasn't he? Um, I say he was born in Paris, but I think he had a Danish wife, if I'm not mistaken. We just make sure. Um, born in Paris. Oh, he had a Paris. He had a Spanish. Um, some kind of Spanish link. I thought there was a Danish thing somewhere. Yeah, it's actually quite fascinating, his backstory. He's got, he's got um, some Peruvian, oh, there it is. He married a Danish woman. Um, so, so oh, there it is, yeah. Because I was going to say, I, I seem to remember him living in Denmark for a while, and there it is. In 1884, he moved to Denmark, where he pursued a business as a tarpaulin salesman. It was not a success. He couldn't speak Danish either, and the Danes did not want French tarpaulins. Anyway, so there you've got an idea of what that's about. This is a picture of him with his wife, who he kind of abandoned. And so it's, it's actually quite interesting that we're going to be covering not necessarily Denmark, but a, a northern country and why people are happier there. Um, it didn't seem to help Gauguin. Uh, so anyway, what, do you, what are you guys saying? Kristen says something, okay. Lisa is awesome. I actually just got a message from her a few minutes ago. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so he says, um, this prospect is only moderately alarming if Gauguin doesn't come down. He says, if my health does not betray me, I shall polish off my canvases and there will be some that will, that will do among them. Okay, so do you think, uh, what do you think of that statement? If my health does not betray me, but what do you think did happen? What do you think does ultimately happen? Mm. 
does his physical health betray him? Does his mental health betray him? Or does his physical and mental health betray him? Well, Cornelia, if you're right about that, then the people in the South, I mean, South Africa, in the South of the Southern Hemisphere, we must be some of the happiest people in the world. Uh, Gloria says, uh, Jalsi says both. Yeah, so again, quite a lot of what he's saying is so potentious here. He's talking about if my health does not betray me. So he's got to have some awareness that it might. And guess what happens? Um, if you think about either cutting your ear off or someone cutting your ear off, that's not, you, you, are, you are injured. You, you, you're you're going to need to heal. You're going to need to become healthy again. But it's not only physical healing. It's also going to be uh, psychological healing, healing and also something else, a kind of spiritual healing as well, because that is the kind of thing that cuts you to your core. You might heal from the, the psychological scar of that, but um, you've got to do some work to get yourself back into um, society in a way, because you you Either you've been kicked out of society or you, you've um, left society with your tail between your legs. And now you must go back to that society. Is that what, are, are you going to have the wherewithal to do that, right? Cornelius says, you strike me as being very happy. Okay. Okay. Um, Oh, Helena says, how are you feeling? I uh, hope you have worked out on your property. Uh, so I can tell you just that things have improved quite a lot. Um, yeah, I'd say things have improved. The stress and tension has steadily been improving. Um, and so that's definitely good. I am def I am very worn out, tired, uh, and 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 um, a lot of it's due to stress leading to lack of sleep. But um, I'm in pretty good shape, bearing in mind what I've been through. So that's that's something. Um, but at least it's not the same level of crap, and at least it's not worse for sure definitely has improved um okay so let's continue um i am almost reconciled to the orchard and and, and not not uh, one not on stretches and it's pendant with his stippling by the way just to give you guys an idea how um how closely I'm involved in a way in 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 art in a sense. Um, I was somewhere. I don't want to be too public about everything, but I was somewhere, and and uh, someone was delivering something, and my brother wasn't around, and so I volunteered. I said, "Well, I can take his delivery on his behalf," and and so that delivery was. For, I'm not sure if it's a role of canvas or a role of, uh, or, or um, I must actually ask him, I'm not sure if it was canvas that was delivered by courier or if it was uh, wooden stretches, the, the thing he uses to frame it on. But I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm literally, my brother's a, an a active artist. And um, so, you know, when we talk about art, it's not hypothetical. He's literally painting and selling his art now in real time. So uh, it's not, you might think, oh, uh, what do you really know about art? Well, my family are artists. So um, my aunt is a full-time, well, she's a, she hasn't made as, I think, a good uh, living as my brother has, but uh, she's, yeah, I, I suppose you could say full-time artist, artist, sculptor, author, whatever. Um, yeah, so so it's not like I'm 
just interested in Van Gogh, it goes a bit deeper than that, which I think some of you have noticed. Okay, so let's continue. Um, they must pass must in the crowd, but I have less trouble working in the full heat than I did in the spring. That's quite interesting that he says it's easier for him to work in the heat of summer. So I guess he's adapted, right, in a sense. Um, just trying to think. Someone told me uh, that the postman once carried Van Gogh out of a field because it passed out. I, I don't know whether he passed out due to dehydration or... I'm going to... I think my TV's just somehow turned on. I don't know if my dog sat on the remote. I'm going to quickly just go and uh, turn that off. I'll be back. Timmy, what are you doing? Timmy, where are you? Timmy. Come. Come, boy. Come. Come, boy. Come. Timmy, come. Favorite toy. He had one of these when he was a little puppy, and his. this is not the original, but uh, it seems to be his favorite. Okay, Timmy. Okay, uh, let's continue. Now, he didn't turn on the TV. I'm not quite sure how it got turned on. Uh, it, it was set onto Netflix. Uh, and then sometimes Netflix plays trailers and previews, and somehow that activated. So, to me, he's an innocent in that regard. He's an innocent victim. <laughs> Um, anyway, he says, I shall soon send you some rolled up canvases and others one by one as it becomes possible to roll them. I should very much like to double the order for the zinc whites. This zinc white is partly the reason why they dry so slowly, but it has advantages in mixing. So can you see his uh, expertise as an artist is in very many dimensions. One of them is this paint from that supplier dries quickest and, and, and this one has got this consistency. And so all of that is helping him become a more effective and efficient artist. Wasn't it rather pleasant this winter at Gula Means to find the landing and even the staircase, not to mention the studio, quite full of canvases. You can understand therefore that I have a certain ambition, it's not the number of canvases, but just that the very mass of them represents real labor on your part as well as mine. The weed fields have been a reason for working. That really says a lot. He's become so productive because he's so caught up in his own symbolism. He's really caught up in the, he's really caught up in the um, symbolic construct of the whole harvest, reaping, sowing, scenario which he's thought about so often in his life and now he's seeing it and seeing it happen you know that that sort of buzzing of um i suppose they actually wouldn't be um probably wouldn't be tractors buzzing like they, they do today but basically just the activity of people uh doing whatever they're doing you know reaping um he gets caught up in that the whole thing of you know putting the haystacks uh, together and um, that obviously has quite a strong significance to him going back decades probably even uh, probably even has a subconscious um, 
harking to his father and to what his father preached kind of thing. Then he says, um, I only just have time to get ready for the next campaign, that of the vineyards. So can you see he's, he's trying to keep up with the season. So he paints orchards in bloom. Then he paints wheat fields that are being harvested. And then the next campaign is vineyards. In other words, where they, um, where the vineyards get um, reaped or what's the word, uh, plucked. And, and that, 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 of course, is where he's going to sell his one and only artwork in his lifetime. And that is actually quite a beautiful painting. Then he says, and between the two, I'd like to do some marines. He means seascapes by that. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy watching Netflix. Sometimes I, I do show him if the animals on TV, I do show him and sometimes he does pay attention. But dogs aren't sight creatures. Um, anyway, the, the orchards meant pink and white, the wheat fields yellow and the marines blue. Now, if you think about just that, uh, if you think about what color epitomizes Van Gogh and then so what theme epitomizes Van Gogh? Well, definitely not orchards and pink and white. And definitely not blue seascapes. And so the answer is that Van Gogh, the thing that makes by far the biggest impression on him is wheat fields and yellow. And those two definitely go hand in hand, right? Perhaps now I shall begin to look around a bit for greens. There's the autumn and that will give the whole scale of the lyre. I'm very uh, curious to know what Gorgon will do. The great thing is not to discourage him. But I think all the same, that his whole plan is nothing but a freak. You do know what I want to repeat once again, that my personal wishes are subordinate to the interests of others. And I still think that someone else might profit from the money that I spend alone, either Vignon or Gauguin or Bernard or someone else. Now, do you, do you notice what's happening? In every letter, you hear Gauguin's name come up a few times. He's becoming part of his daily thought process. And um, the question is, in a good way or, or, or not in a good way? Is it healthy anticipation or not? Two people who have some sort of understanding or even three do not spend uh, much more than one, not even on paint. So then without counting the extra work done, you would have the satisfaction of keeping two or three going instead of one. Now it's becoming three. <laughs> I think he's thinking Gauguin and Bernard. Maybe he's thinking if Bernard comes, Gauguin will come as well. Anyway, this sooner or later, and I provided that, provided that I'm as strong as the others, believe me, there wouldn't be much chance of disappointment. He's not talking about his mental health is talking about his physical health. There's nothing wrong with his uh, mental health, certainly at this point. Seeing that if they had difficulties with their work, I should have been through those difficulties myself and I'd know what it is all about. So that one would have a perfect right, it might even be one's duty to urge them to work. And that is what must be done. If I'm alone, again, a admission that that's a issue for him. If I'm alone, I can't help it. But honestly, I've, ne I've less need of company than of furiously hard work. And that is why I'm boldly ordering canvases and paints. That is how he feels in July 1888. And that is exactly how he feels in July 1890, when he, shortly before he dies, he basically says, I need to work hard. That's what I'm motivated to do. And that's why I'm ordering more canvas. It's the same Van Gogh, in a sense, in the in, in July. Did you guys see that? In July 1888, as two years later. Deborah, thanks for joining us. Yvonne says, I don't know if it's going to be healthy anticipation. Okay, uh, he says, it's the only time I feel I'm alive when I'm drudging away at my work. That's kind of a tragic statement, isn't it? Maybe it's not completely true. I mean, what about when he's 
doesn't he feel a bit alive when he's in a brothel? If I had company, I should feel it less of a necessity, or rather I'd work at more complicated things. But alone, I only count on the exaltation that comes to me at certain moments, and then I let myself run on extravagances. So the canvases that I bought here not so long ago are almost all used up. When I send you the rolled up canvases, perhaps you could take a goodish lot of stuff that isn't very important off the stretches, so that by the end of the year, we may be able to show, say, 50 pieces to Pissarro and the others. And the rest, I mean, the studies will be stock for reference. And when they're properly dry, they can be kept in a portfolio or cupboard without their taking up too much space. A handshake for you and the comrades if you see any of them. Okay. Quite an interesting letter. Uh, 8th July. Dear, my dear Theo, thank you for your letter and the 50 franc note enclosed. As for the Tangi business, don't get mixed up in it. Only I beg you not to risk entrusting him with the new pictures, but withdraw them in answer to his presenting an account and asking for an advance. Yeah, that's right. Okay, believe me, you have the tangy woman to deal with, and if not, and if he himself is behaving like this, then he's playing me false. Tangi still has a study of mine which he himself expected to sell. At the most, I owe him that, but I do not owe him a penny in money. To begin to argue about it would mean an argument with the old woman which no mortal could stand. According to them, the Tangis, Gulami, Monet, and Gauguin uh, must all owe their money. Is that true or not? Anyway, if they do not pay, why should I pay? I'm sorry I thought of getting pains from him again to please him. He can be sure that in the future I shall get no more. So some enmity with, with people that he used to know in Paris. Do I beg you get back my new pictures? Uh, that is enough. Tangis zinc white at 40 centimes is just a little bit more expensive than Tassé's big tubes. Okay. Talks about kicking him, him out afterward without mercy. Well, that's going to happen to you, my friend. He says, if you give them something on account, it would be acknowledging a debt that I make bold to deny. Never. So do not let yourself be caught. The only money I really owe is to Bing in that I still have 90 francs worth of Japanese stuff on commission. But when you think of how many people I have sent straight to Bing's, it is more profitable to him to let that go. Can you see how he's, he's really quite a lawyer person? He's, uh, no matter what someone says about him, he's always got quite a clever sort of response. He's saying, even if I owe someone money, I've done so much marketing for that person to send money to them that I effectively don't owe them any money, right? Okay. Um, what does he say about dishonesty? I tell myself that if I can manage to do 50 studies at 200 francs this year, in a way I shall not have been very dishonest in having eaten and drunk as though I had a right to it. Now, this is pretty steep because I have, at the moment, about 30 painted studies. I do not value them all at that price. Well, that's, um, that's, that's some humility from his side. All the same, some of them must be worth it. But the cost of executing them leaves me very, very poor for all that. He's saying, I've done a quite a bunch of bum paintings. I've wasted my time on a lot of crap. And I quite, I kind of know that feeling a bit. Sometimes you write a book and you feel like it could have been a lot better, the cover or whatever. And um, But you need that. It's a learning curve. You need to find out what you shouldn't do in order to know what you should do which is what he says there, all the same, some of them must be worth it, but the cost of executing, the, okay, 
Changi did not come along to ask for a settlement of a debt that is infinitely doubtful. Whatever money you might have to spare for that purpose, my Lord, I am in greater need of it here. I stint myself in many things, not that I think that a hardship, but I think that the money which I shall need in the future depends rather on the vigor of my efforts now. So here, here again is a statement where he's saying, if I don't really have enough money for whatever, I don't consider that hardship. That's quite a tough mentality. Then he says, they made trouble at the post office saying that the drawings which I was sending you were too big to be forwarded that way. So you can imagine that is one of his most regular contacts is with the post and the postman, right? And in the, in the documentary or the animated movie Loving Vincent, I think the person who ends up kind of investigating Van Gogh's life is the postman's son in the story. Almost like the person closest to him, who was almost a friend, but, but basically just knew him very well, was the postman, right? You kind of get that sense. That's a great, that's a great quote, uh, Gwen, great quote. Okay. Um, yeah, that's right. And that's so true. He, he's good at expressing his emotions. He doesn't have, he's not like emotionally blocked. He's not suppressing his emotions. He's very open with what's going on. He says, um, I have scraped off a big painted study in Olive Garden with a figure of Christ in blue and orange and an angel in yellow, red earth, hills, green and Red earth, hills green and blue, olive trees with violet and carmine trunks, and green, gray, and blue foliage. A citron yellow sky. I scraped it off because I can I tell myself that I must not do figures of that importance without models. So Yeri painted a painting, painted the painting, and then scraped all the paint off. And now he's gonna paint something else over that. Again, that's something you kind of expect from a hard up but intense artist. Certainly it would be better to my thinking if Gauguin came here, so another reference to him, with the winter coming on. Still no answer from Russell. Bock is staying with McKnight, that's the American, and it seems that he's working very hard, but I've seen nothing yet. He's a young man whose appearance I like very much, a face like a razor blade, green eyes, and a touch of distinction. McKnight looks very common beside him. After what I what you told me about him, I'm going to see him this afternoon. I read that Bing is giving a Japanese exhibition and publishing a review on Japanese art. Have you seen it? I find it dreadful sometimes not to be able to get hold of another batch of Japanese prints. And then he asks him about, have you read this book? It's very interesting. I have exactly the same thing to tell you today as last Thursday. The end of the week will be very tough going. If you can send your next letter a day or two earlier, so much the better. Have you been able to find that book of A. Cassant, the ABCD of drawing? I really do need it. Th that is definitely almost funny. Van Gogh, at 35 years of age, he's got two years left to live and he's going to become this towering powerhouse of art. And he says to his brother, won't you please send me the ABCD of drawing? Maria certainly ought to buy one for himself. I'll write Russell again. Um, that's the reason why I'm going to see his friends, McKnight and Box, so as to be able to talk about them and have an excuse for writing him before he replies. If the four other drawings that I have in mind are like the first two I've done, then you will have an epitome of a very beautiful corner of Provence. So he's still waxing lyrical about what a, how beautiful the landscape is. It was very nice of Gulami to come to look. I'm very much obliged to him. But on the whole, I myself am dissatisfied with everything I do. That's actually a good sign in a sense, that, that he's got high standards, that he expects more from himself. And I mean, to be honest, to be honest, so far, he hasn't really painted that much that's worth anything. Like that's, I mean, he's painted the... That sort of yellow field, that's good, but 
he needs to up his game. Um, we can see it, and it's good that he realizes it. Why move about much? When I see the orchards again, shan't I be in a better condition? Absolutely. And won't it be something new, a renewed attack on a new season on the same subject? Absolutely. And the same for the whole year, for harvest time. That's that's a great, is, is heads in the right space there. I would like to send you the 30 studies now in case this might make it easy to find the money for Gorgon's coming. Or do you think, do you think him sending his art going to make any difference? Well done, Schufenecker. The old Thomas really ought to buy 100 francs worth from me or from Gauguin, and then we'd almost have it. What is Bing's exhibition like? Uh, if you see the manager there, tell him that I'm here and that I asked him to leave my deposit alone and that if I were there, I should exert myself more for him. The Lutrex have just come. I think they are beautiful. Goodbye for the present. I'll write again soon. Don't get into a panic over the Tangi woman for there's no justice in it. And it annoys me to find out Tangi behaving like this. You may, you may be sure that if I owed him the money, I'd say so. But it was on different terms, that is to say that I never pay in cash, but that he is a lien on the pictures, and even that only by agreement. Ever yours, Vincent. You can count on it that Bernard will have the same problem with the Tangis, only worse. Okay. So can you see there's already a bit of kind of bickering going on in the background, someone that's not very happy with him, and he's pushing back, kind of doubling down. Okay. Vincent to Theo, 9th of uh, July. My dear Theo, I've come back from a day at Montmayeur, right? That's at the Abbey. That's just um, just outside all. It's, it's maybe maybe two or three miles, four or five miles at the most from all. It's just right outside. And my friend, the sub lieutenant, kept me company. The two of us explored the old garden and stole excellent figs there. If it had been bigger, it would have made me think of Zola's Paradou, great reeds, vines, ivy, fig trees, olive trees, pomegranates with lusty flowers of the brightest orange, hundred-year-old cypresses, ash trees, and willows, rock oaks, half-demolished flights of steps, ogive windows in ruins, blocks of white rock covered with lichen, and scattered fragments of collapsed walls here and there among the greenery. Can, can you see how it's just a, it's a wonderful place to paint? It's a beautiful setting. It's, it's ruined, um, uh, you know, large, spectacular, but ruined architecture, architecture within the context of nature reclaiming its place, the gardens, the, the country, surrounding countryside. Zircon, uh, welcome. <laughs> okay. Yesterday I went to Fontvielle to pay a visit to Bock and McKnight. That's the first time I think he's actually spelt his name right. Should actually be one word. Uh, only these gentlemen had gone on a little trip to Switzerland for eight days. I think the heat is still doing me good in spite of the mosquitoes and flies. And they actually is he drew a, I don't know if that's a, fly or a beetle. Uh, so there must be quite a few flies. The grasshopper is not like those at home, but like this, like those you see in Japanese albums. <coughs> I think he's actually talking about not grasshoppers, but um, what do they call them? They kind of make like a buzzing noise. Um, can't quite think of the name now. It talks about golden green cantharides in swarms on the olive trees. These grasshoppers, I think they're called, yeah, that's it. Um, cicada. Um, sing at least as loud as a frog. Yeah, it's like they make like a sizzling noise. Yeah. I've been, uh, you get a lot of them in Korea. Uh, sometimes there are so many, the sizzling is so loud. It's like deafening. You actually feel like you're going mad. Um, it's like a deafening, sizzling sound. Wow. Um, and I think they make that sound to sort of court 
the females. I think that's what that's all about. I've again been thinking that when you remember that I painted the portrait of Pierre Tanguy, that's this one. Oh, it's not showing. Um, also the portrait of Mother Tangi, which they sold, and of their friend that I bought without discount, 250 francs worth of paints on which naturally he has made something. And finally that I've been his friend no less than he has been mine. I have very serious reason to doubt his right to claim money from me. And it, it really is squared by the study he still has of mine. So a little bit of continuing bickering about someone that he used to know in France. All the more so because there was an express arrangement that he should pay himself by the sale of a picture. Xanthi, Mother Tangi, and some other ladies have, have, uh, have, by some queer freak of nature, heads of silex or flint. Certainly these ladies are a good deal more dangerous in civilized society. They circulate in more... It's quite a long sentence, this. Um, the, these ladies are a good deal more dangerous in civilized society they circulate in than the poor citizens bitten by mad dogs who live in the Pasteur Institute. The Pasteur Institute is where they were researching rabies, right? The old Tangi would be right a thousand times over to kill his lady, but he won't do it any more than Socrates. And for this reason, old Tangi is more in common in resignation and long suffering anyhow with the ancient Christian martyrs and slaves and with the present day pimps of Paris. Nevertheless, there's no reason to pay him 80 francs, but it is a reason for never losing your temper with him, even if he loses his. When, as you may do in this instance, you chuck him out or at least send him packing. I'm writing Russell at the same time. I think we know, don't we, that the English, the Yankees have this, this much in common with the Dutch that their charity is very Christian. Quite an interesting statement. The English, the Yankees, have this much in common with the Dutch that their charity is very Christian. Okay. Uh, now the rest of us not being very good Christians, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> That's what I can't put out of my head again writing like this. This Bock has a head rather like a Flemish gentleman of the time of the compromise of the nobles of the time of Taciturn, William the Silent and Marnix. I shouldn't wonder if he's a decent fellow. Oh, excuse me. Am I okay? Yes, I am okay. Why? Why? Um, I think it is it is well to work, especially at drawing just now, and to arrange to have paint and canvas in reserve for when Gorgon comes. I wish paint was as little of a worry to work with as pen and paper. I often pass up a painted study for fear of wasting the color. With paper, whether it's a letter uh, I'm coming, sorry, whether it's a letter I'm writing or drawing, uh, I'm working on, there's never a misfire. So many leaves of Watman, so many drawings. I think that if I were rich, I should spend less than I do now. Well, old Martin would say, then it's up to you to get rich, and he's right, as he is about the masterpiece. Do you remember reading in Guy de Maupassant, the gentleman hunter of, the, of rabbits and the other game, who had hunted so hard for 10 years and was so exhausted by running after the game that when he wanted to get married, he found he was impotent, which caused him the greatest embarrassment and consternation. Without being in the same state as this gentleman, as to its being either my duty or my desire to get married, I begin to resemble him in physique. It's quite a um, sudden, um, what's the word? You know, he's, he's kind of getting quite, he's getting quite um, personal quite suddenly, where he says, uh, he talks about his desire to get married. One, one wonders whether Theo has mentioned that he's in love. Um, bear in mind, by December, he's going to be... Uh, 
I'm not sure if he's going to be engaged by December or married by December. I think engaged, which actually also makes you think that when he gets married, Vincent isn't actually at the wedding. That's quite a, that's another thing that he misses out on. I could be wrong on that, but that's how I, I understand it. So, yeah, he's talking about impotency here. He says, uh, according to the worthy master Zim, man becomes ambitious once he becomes impotent. That's a really fascinating comment. And it actually makes me think of Alec Murdoch. The, the, uh, do you see what I'm getting at when I say that? I don't mean that Alec Murdoch is sexually impotent uh, in a fertility sense, but he perceives himself, I think, uh, as not potent enough within his situation. And that, that leads to ambition. And who knows, maybe the same does apply to Van Gogh, where he becomes ambitious as an artist as he starts to appreciate that his youth is fading, that his potency as a man is fading, that that gets him to up his game, right? I mean, uh, I don't know if I should include myself in this, but I do know when I, shortly after I turned 40 years old, that was when I started writing seriously and working as, I mean, I've always been a hard worker, but working as um, consistently as I have basically the past 10 years. Incidentally, I don't really like to cover true crime on this channel, but good news, Oscar Pistorius' uh, parole was denied. So that is actually a good thing. Did Vincent paint orchards with, I think you mean orchards with O-R-C-H-A-R-D-S. Uh, yes, he has. Okay, so let's continue. Um, obviously, when he says man becomes ambitious, he, I think he means men and women, right? Um, and the impotency is to do with, it's not literal impotence it's it's a kind of personal sense that i'm not almost that i'm losing it whatever it is um now though it's pretty much all all um one to me whether i'm impotent or not i'm damned if that's going to drive me to ambition it's quite a strange statement uh, it's almost like he's saying See, he has a different concept of ambition. He's not trying to be rich. He's just trying to kind of survive. He just wants to kind of um, make it as an artist. He's not trying to be rich. He's not trying to build an empire. He's just trying to be an artist. That's He's, he's got fairly modest goals. Um, right? It is only the greatest philosopher of his place and time, and consequently of all places and all times, good old master Pangloss, who could, if he were here, give me advice and calm my soul. There, the letter to Russell is in its envelope, and I've uh, written as I intended. I asked him if he had any news of Reed, and I asked you the same question. I told Russell that I left him free to take what he liked, and from the first consignment I sent as well. And that uh, I was only waiting for his explicit answer to know whether he preferred to make his choice at his or your place. That if in the former circumstance he wanted to see them at his own house, you would send him along some orchards as well and fetch the lot back again when he had made, uh, made his choice. Here's another reference to Gorgon and then another one and another one. So can you see it's... Obviously, this is um, very much becoming part of his daily thought process. More and more, worse and worse as well. So he says you can't quarrel with that. If he takes nothing from Gorgan, it's because he cannot. Then he talks about Gorgan having been ill with the further complication of his having been laid up in bed and having to pay his doctor 
if it all fell rather heavily on us and we were all the more anxious to find a purchaser for a painting. And there you have it. I mean, you can't say it any better than that. I am thinking a lot about Gauguin and I would have plenty of ideas for pictures and about work in general. I have a charwoman now for one thing. So Van Gogh's now even got someone working for him. She sweeps and scrubs the house for him twice a week. I'm banking very much on her, counting on her to make our beds if we decide to sleep in the house. Otherwise, we could make some arrangement with a fellow where I'm staying now. Anyhow, we'll try to manage so that it would work out as an economy instead of more expense. How is your health now? Are you still going to Groovy? What you tell me of that conversation at the Novo Athens is interesting. You know the little portrait by Desboutin that Portier very, has very well. It certainly is a strange phenomenon that all artists and poets, musicians, painters are unfortunate in material things, the happy ones as well. What you said lately about Guy de Maupassant is a fresh proof of it. That, that brings up again the eternal question, is life completely visible to us or isn't it isn't it rather that this side of death, we see one hemisphere only? It's a question really about reality. Are we able to see the full reality? Cool. Okay. Uh, just on that subject of peach trees, um, so right outside the studio are two peach trees, and uh, the one that was in the shade in the winter is about a foot taller than the one that was in the sun, and they are, I'd say, just starting to lose their leaves now. That I've just seen like one or to um, one or two leaves turning yellow. I mean, that's that's like 1%, but it's, it is starting to happen. So we'll see um, when spring returns and the other tree gets favored by the light first, whether what will happen. We'll see whether they'll, th that tree, the other tree will sort of pull ahead or whether the tree that's um, tall at this point um, makes more of an effort knowing where it is, knowing what, having experienced one season. You can also imagine in the same way that Van Gogh, uh, every successive harvest that he paints, every successive spring that he paints, every successive autumn that he paints, he may find that autumn is his favorite season or autumn is his most successful season. In the same way, a tree may get better at, um, what's the word, anticipating the light every successive year, knowing when to drop its leaves. That's another thing that's going to be quite interesting. Are both these trees going to drop their leaves at the same time? Because that's also a, a calculated um, decision. Uh, the sooner you drop your leaves, the, the less vulnerable you are to um, winter, I guess. Um, but, but also, if you hold on to them later, then you can actually grow that extra little bit compared to your companion. So when do you make that decision? And make no mistake, that is a decision where two trees stand beside each other, they need to calculate, right, in terms of that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they Look, when they fruited, they were very short. They were maybe a meter tall. Um, the one in the sun made quite, quite a lot more fruit, um, but ultimately, I don't think I could eat any of the peaches because the birds got to them first and, and they were they ended up being quite small before they 
they were eaten when they were still quite small. So hopefully there'll be dozens of peaches um, next year and they'll be, sorry, not next year, later this year. And then there'll be, um, there'll be enough to, for the birds and the human beings to go around. Yeah. I guess, yeah. But it's really interesting that trees also have to make some complicated decisions. It's quite interesting. Okay, let's, uh, let's continue. So, I mean, a, a, a tree will also be asking that question, is life completely visible to us, to me? Uh, do I know what's going on? And obviously, the taller the tree is, the more it can say, okay, I, I, I see, I can feel where I am. I can feel the context that I find myself in. Yeah, it will be. It will be. I'll, uh, maybe I'll do it on the show, the first peach that, that I can properly eat. Painters, to take them only being dead and buried, speak to the next generation or to several succeeding generations through their work. Is that all or is there more besides? In a painter's life, death is not perhaps the hardest thing there is. Quite a statement there. Let's hope so, Stephanie. Can you imagine if they like, you know, it's, uh, not very sweet? I think so. Okay. Um, For my own part, I declare, and in a way, trees are a lot like people. Uh, you see a certain surface. You see what is above the surface. Meanwhile, there's a lot going on below the surface where you find your resources below the surface. You don't find your resources entirely on the surface. Um, you know, it's like beauty is more than just skin deep. For my own part, I declare I know nothing, whatever about it, but to look at the stars always makes me dream. And so, again, you get that idea of starry night being evoked in his thought process, in his, in his, um, it's something that is daydreaming about, right? And that is the way that he kind of has the most hopeful, optimistic um, impressions for himself. It's quite, a, it's quite a poetic statement. As simply as I dream of the black dots of a map representing towns and villages, why, I ask myself, should the shining dots of the sky not be as accessible as the black dots on the map of France? That's quite a, um, Elon Musk would, would love that statement. I mean, you should actually have that, um, you should have that probably like in a boardroom or something. Um, do you think I should make that the title of this video? What do you guys say? Should I make that, that the title of this video? I think it's better than his downward spiral begins. What do you guys say? Well, I think you can see what's happening. So let's have a quick look at the poll. Why is Paul Gauguin interested in joining Van Gogh in all? Uh, then the 8% don't seem to know him very well. They say they are very, very good friends. Actually, they're not. He's definitely not a good friend. Even Van Gogh seems to acknowledge that he's not that reliable. Um, B, because he's deep in debt, he is. Uh, C, because he's down on his luck, is, is that as well. He can't sell his art. He's sick and he's in debt. So D is the right answer there both B and C. So well done. Well done to those who voted. Okay, let's quickly just change this. Fourteen letters too long.
that should do it. Okay. Can you believe it? We had episode 48, and each one is about two, three hours long. That that is a lot of letters, right? It's a lot of writing. It's a lot of writing. Okay, let's continue. Right, so he says, if we took the train to get to Tarasan or Ruin, to take death to reach a star, we take death to reach a star. One thing undoubtedly true in this reasoning is this, that while we are alive, we cannot get to a star any more than when we are dead, we can take the train. So it doesn't seem impossible to me that cholera, gravel, pleurisy, and cancer are the means of celestial locomotion. How's that for an original way of thinking about disease? Just as steamboats, omnibuses, and railways are the terrestrial means, to die quietly of old age would be to go there on foot. So he's saying, if you die as an old man, you, you'll get to the stars on foot. If you die of some kind of spectacular you know, infection, well, then you get almost like a rocket ship trip to the stars. That's anyway how he's, he frames it. Again, he's not a very pessimistic fellow, is he? Now I'm going to bed because it is late and I wish you good night and good luck. A handshake yours, Vincent. Quite a, um, quite a, quite a nice letter there. Uh, if you want to read it on your own time, I'll just put a copy of it in chat. Um, he definitely has his moments. Okay, so here are a couple of sketches you may not have seen before. Rocks and trees. I think that's pretty good. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty well executed. If you compare that to the painting he did earlier, of just like a park, this is definitely an improvement. What I like is the distant view there, just to the side. Let me just take myself out of there. What I quite like is that part. I think there's maybe a bit too much um, emphasis on the foreground. I, if I was painting this, I would have cut that part away. Just made a little bit more of the background in this picture, but otherwise quite well executed. And then here is uh, Olive Trees Montmayeur. Also, um, you can see he's starting to reach the place he needs to be for, um, for, for the whole Cypress series, right? You can see that that's starting. Can you see how he's, he's painting, sorry, he's sketching the wind in these branches? Do you see that? Um, that's not that's not just there's a tree. He's actually drawing the wind in the tree. Do you see that over there? And that is in a way what makes Van Gogh quite um, idiosyncratic. And yeah, birds as well. And then this is landscape with train. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's lovely. That's really beautiful. That's one of his best landscapes after the, that sort of yellow field. Do you guys agree with that? Look at the detail. Detail and depth, right? Okay, well, see, so can you see that he's starting to get better at capturing the human condition? He's not just painting a landscape, he's trying to paint our place on this planet, our, um, where we find ourselves in the world. That, that's actually what he's trying to capture. It's not just a tree and a figure. He's trying to say, this is us in our world. What do we make of it? <laughs> okay, so here's 13 July, my dear Theo, 
I've just sent off to you by post a roll containing five big pen drawings. You have a sixth of that series from Montmayur, a group of very dark pines, and the town of Arles in the background. Um, afterward, I want to add a view of the whole of the ruins, and you have a hurried scratch of it among the small drawings. Since I cannot help at all with money, uh, just as this moment when we are, um, shall I bring myself into this? Um, since I cannot help at all with money, just at this moment when we are entering this combination with Gorgon, I have done all I could to show through my work that I've had the plan at heart. In my opinion, the two views of the crowd and the of the country on the banks of the Rhone are the best things I've done in pen and ink. If Thomas should happen to want them, he cannot have them for less than 100 francs each. Even if in that case I do make him a present of the three others, as we must get some money. So can you see, starting to get quite confident. Um, I'm not going to take less than 100 francs for each one. Well, uh, yeah, don't worry, you won't get, uh, anyway. It says, but we cannot um, give them for less. Not everyone would have the patience to get themselves devoured by mosquitoes and to struggle against the nagging malice of this constant mistral. Not to mention that I've spent the whole days outside with little bread and milk since it was too far to go back to the town every once in a while. So there is a real insight into exactly what he's experiencing, right? There's a real insight into a day in the life of Vincent van Gogh right now. Let me read that again. Not everyone would have the patience to get themselves devoured by mosquitoes and to struggle against the nagging malice of this constant mistral, not to mention that I've spent whole days outside with a little bread and milk, since it was too far to go back to the town every once in a while. I've already said more than once how the Camargue and the Kral, except for the difference in color and the clearness of the atmosphere, remind me of the old Holland of Ray Stahl's time. Um, <clears throat> I think that these two I've spoken of, the flat countryside covered with vines and stubble fields seen from a height will give you an idea of it. So let's have a look at a couple more of these uh, sketches. Uh, view of all. And here is hill with ruins of Montmayer. It's quite nice. That is def that's very recognizably the Abbey. It's interesting that he puts a big rock in front of it. And here is another one, Ruins of Montmayer. Not much going on there. And La Crau. I think the next one is quite exceptional. That's not bad. A bit bland, but but not bad. Um, but have a look at this one. Harvest in Provence. I think that's basically just a sketched version of the painting. Uh, and this, that's a watercolor. I'm not going to show you that one because that will spoil it all. Okay. So he says, uh, I've already said more than once of the Camargue, and I've read that. Believe me, I'm tired out by these drawings. I've begun a painting as well, but there's no way of doing it with the mistral blowing. There's absolutely nothing doing. So despite, despite his resilience, despite his um, strength and courage and verve, the, the, the wind has sort of won the battle. Uh, it's just blowing too strongly now at this point. Um, I'm going to not read that paragraph uh, or that one. Then he says, the fascination that these huge planes have for me is very strong, so that I felt no weariness in spite of the really worrisome circumstances, mistral and mosquitoes. So that's really his, his life summed up in, in two or three words, day after day after day, mistral and mosquitoes. If a view makes, and then I guess milk as well, to, to sustain him. 
if a view makes you forget these little annoyances, it must have something in it. That's quite a, a statement as well. What he's seeing is, um, you know, uh, moving him. Okay, goes on to say, uh, you will see, however, that there's no attempt at effect. At first sight, it is like a map, a strategic plan, as far as the execution goes. Besides, I walked there with a painter and he said, there's something that would be boring. There is something that would be boring to paint. Yet I went fully 50 times to Montmayeur to look at this flat landscape. And was I wrong? So he has definitely gotten caught up especially in Montmayeur, right? I'm so glad I went there because I was thinking, do I have time to go there? I'm glad I did. Um, I certainly got to know Montmayeur better than, than um, Saint-Rami, which means I maybe need to go back there. Uh, it says, I went for a walk there um, with someone who was not a painter. And when I said to him, look, to me, that is as beautiful and as infinite as the sea. He said, and he knows the sea. For my part, I like this better than the sea because it, because it is no less infinite and yet you feel that it is in, inhabited. So can you see how he is thinking in very celestial, cerebral, eternal um, terms? He's... He doesn't just see the land, he sees an ocean that's inhabited by us. It's in a way a proxy for heaven or for the afterlife in a way. What a picture I would make of it if there was not this damn wind. <laughs> that is the maddening thing. And no matter where you, you set up your easel, and that is largely why the painted studies are not so finished as the drawings. The canvas is shaking all the time. It does not bother me when I'm drawing. Have you read uh, uh, Mod Mademoiselle Chrysanthine? It gave me the impression that the real Japanese have nothing on their walls. That, that description of the cloister or pagoda where there was nothing, the drawings and curiosities all being hidden in the drawers. That is how you must look at Japanese art in a very bright room, quite bare and open to the country. Would you like to experiment with these two drawings of the Crow and the banks of the Rhone, which do not look Japanese, which really they are, perhaps more so uh, than some others? Look at them in some cafe where it's clear and blue and nothing else in the way, whilst outside. Perhaps they need a reed frame, like a thin stick. Yeah, I work in a bare room, four white walls and a red paved floor. If I urge you to look at these two drawings in this way, it is because... I so much want to give you a true idea of the simplicity of nature here. Well, as to Gauguin, suppose we show the drawings and the harvest too, and the zouave to Thomas. A handshake and thank you for the two tubes of zinc white that Tessé has just sent. I'm curious to know if Maurier will remember the spots. Ever yours, Vincent. Okay. 15th July, um, a shortish letter to Bernard. Um, so let's have a look at this. This is um, newly mown lawn with weeping tree. So that's obviously where the it's been mowed and the grass sort of piles up on the side. Um, La Croix, I guess we've already seen that. We've seen that already. Is there anything else? Okay. Um, my dear comrade Bernard, perhaps you'll be inclined to forgive me for not replying to your letter immediately when you see that I'm sending you a little batch of sketches along with this letter. In the sketch, the garden, maybe there's something like shaggy carpets woven of flowers and greenery. Well, anyway, I wanted to answer your quotations with a pen, by, but not writing down words. Today, today too, I'm hardly in a mood for discussions. I'm up to my ears in work. So, you know, the, this, this, um, this picture, that didn't just happen. That it wasn't just a fluke. It's, he worked very hard day after day after day the previous summer 
to reach that level of execution. So it wasn't just, uh, this isn't random. This, this is a process of improving. And what I like about this is he's got the right balance of color. It's not all purple or all yellow. He's got a nice balance of different colors, right? Whereas I, I feel in the past, he didn't really have the balance and proportion very well, especially when he was painting those uh, spring blossoms. Okay. I've done some large pen and ink drawings uh, to an immense stretch of flat country, a bird's eye view of it from the top of a hill, vineyards and fields of newly reaped wheat. All this multiplied in endless repetitions, stretching away toward the horizon, like the surface of the sea. And that's the second time that he said that. It does not have a Japanese look, and yet it really, it, it, it is really the most Japanese thing I've done. A microscopic figure of a plowman, a little train running across the wheat field. This is all the animation there is in it. So, so that is actually an incredible statement to read, him saying the word animation, given what ultimately happened to his art, that the, his art ends up being the first animated oil move, or, or, um, the first animated movie where they animate oil paintings ever. It's quite something. Anyway, he says, listen, one of the first days after I came to this spot, I talked to a painter friend of mine who said how boring it would be to do this. So this is kind of a repeat of what he's saying to his brother. It obviously made quite a quite an impression. He says, I didn't say anything, but I thought it's so astounding that I didn't even have the strength to give that idiot a piece of my mind. And I'm still going over there over and over again. All right, I've done two drawings of it, of that flat landscape where there was nothing but infinity, eternity. This kind of reminds me a little bit when you're in a true crime space and someone says, uh, wow, you know, you are so boring. What are you even saying? Where someone else will say, I can see what you're talking about. And that, there's a saying in Afrikaans, short took short. Um, it's almost like birds of a feather flock together. Uh, he's just a different kind of person. He sees something incredible and amazing and symbolic in what someone else just sees as a boring view of flatness. And that's, that's one way to happiness is you can look at something ordinary and see heaven in it and see the plight of the human condition, but rendered in a hopeful way, you know, um, uh, I was having, I, I felt like I, I experienced a bit of that today. Um, I had quite a strange day today. And then I um, I hadn't actually managed to take Timmy for a walk. I'd, I'd take him for a walk every single day and I just hadn't gotten around to it the last day or so. So I ended up just going for an impromptu late lunch with a friend and took Timmy along. And the view of what we were looking at, the, the green fields, the, the, uh, the clouds, uh, but it was just like this late, late summer scene. Um, just really looked, you know, just the way the shadows of the trees were slowly extending over this long green field. Um, everything very, very green, the sky, blue the, the, and, and just um, there's something very emblematic of um, it being one of the last days of summer here. I mean, right now it's quite cold. It was actually, I wouldn't say hot, but it was warm uh, while we were sitting there and everything was so green. It was like, this is, this is one of the last best days. And when you see that, not just in and of itself, but, as a fragment of life that represents life itself, that's quite profound. Where you say this this scene that I see in front of me is in a way emblematic of my entire life or one's entire life. Um, maybe it's not. Maybe 
you know, but but certainly it felt like that at the time. Yeah. And so, you know, you may find one particular day as spring starts its process in America or in Europe, you might say, this is how I'm feeling right now. I'm feeling like something's about to happen. I'm, I'm feeling like um, something amazing is about to happen. Or they, I just have this feeling of, of hope or whatever. And then you might have that same feeling in the middle of summer where you feel like, I'm really feeling on top of my game right now. I'm feeling energized. I'm feeling inspired. I'm feeling warm all over, whatever, right? And then by the same token, by the end of that summer, you say, this was a well-lived summer. This was a good summer. This was, look look how we, we came through the summer, and this is where we are now, right? Yeah. And so the way Van Gogh appreciates the seasons is that the season is a symbol of the soul right the the cycles the cycles of life and death and every successive season you can see into that symbolism in a deeper and more profound way right you can see the detail in that landscape in the way it's coming to life in a more profound way more color, more detail, more life, more whatever, right? Can you see how that, that can be really quite a profound experience if you allow it to be? Zergon says, I'm spring cleaning. Sarah says, we, we really are soulless selves. Well, I mean, human beings are tied to the cycles of the sun. So if you think about it, when the sun goes down, we go down for the night as well. We are programmed to be around when the sun's shining and and not around. We we literally programmed to to shut down for seven eight hours when the sun's not shining. It's like you you don't you you're not you're not geared for the night. Leave that to the cats and the mice and the owls. You need to right. So we we are we are solar cells. And that's also why we get quite sick. Um, it is becoming, I mean, you can see it's quite cold. Uh, but I can't say that I'm seeing a lot of yellow in the trees. It's still green. So when we start having our first frosts, which will probably be in the next week or two um, or three, then, then yeah, but certainly I, I don't look around and see red, leaves and yellow leaves uh, i'm seeing one or two on the beach tree outside that's very little um yeah definitely alina says i'm so looking forward to warm weather next weekend sounds good yeah i mean the i grew up on the ideas of white christmas and all of that but i remember christmases and i've had one or two white christmases i had one in austria but um i've um i i tend to think of christmas as the beach and being warm and and yeah so it's, it's totally different in other words christmas is true abundance christmas as um being free and being warm and being and, you know, so it's totally different. Okay, let's continue. Um, is it autumn now? Strictly speaking, it is. But it's really the beginning of autumn, I would say. There's not really much visual evidence of it. It's starting to get cold. Okay, so let's continue. I mean, the days here, you can still easily walk around in shorts. It's, it's still warm and even hot. Um, but the nights are starting to get quite cold. Okay, so he goes on to say, um, I think it even more beautiful than the ocean because it is inhabited. Same thing he said to his brother. Which of the two spectators was more of an artist? Okay, same thing. Um, yeah, he mentions Gauguin. He says, the fact is that Gauguin, who has been very ill, is probably going to spend next winter with me here. That's actually true. He's going to be with him 
in the winter, so October and November. Uh, it is the cost of his journey which causes us a lot of worry. But once he's here, my goodness, when you are two, you spend less than when you are alone. Now, if you just think about this, Theo and Vincent's worry is the cost of his journey from Brittany. Well, guess what happens when Van Gogh loses his ear? His brother's got to come all the way, in other words, doubling that cost and then going all the way back and taking Gauguin back. So you can just imagine what that's all about. That's kind of um, a disaster. Anyway, it says, um, once Gauguin is here, the two of us will try to do something in Marseille. We'll probably have an exhibition there. Well, no, you won't. Now I should like to have some things of yours too. Talks about a mutual exchange of sketches. Um, talks about Gauguin again. Um, Gauguin as well as myself will invite you to participate in it. Blah, 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 blah. And that's the end of that letter. Okay. 15 July. So I think I'm going to stop at this letter. I mean, I'll read this letter and then stop. Let's just see what the next one is. But there are a couple dealing with a the postman. Um, there's the sower. I, I was actually hoping I would get to the postman. Um, is it the next one? Flowering garden with path. Not terribly good, especially not compared to this, right? Um, that's where he is then, and this is where he would be a year later, right? So I think it's the next letter that he, he paints the postman, or is it the one after? So this is a picture by Gauguin. It's the kind of thing Gauguin will paint. It's far more simple and kind of elegant in a way. Where is the postman? I think it's this one. There it is. Portrait of the postman. So, yeah, I was hoping we could get that far, but we definitely not. I'm not going to go much more than a couple more minutes. So I'm going to read one more letter, but this is what's waiting for us at the end of July. But oh, that's what I want to show you. Can you see how much better, if you look at that picture, that's the postman, right? Can you see how much better this execution is than that one? Do you agree that that's a much better execution? And, and I think part of it is, is starting to understand how much color to use and what proportion to use, right? Again, compare that to that. This is almost all blue, whereas this is um more more proportioned you see that can you see that this is a much better executed picture look at that and then look at this this one's almost like um you didn't put that much effort into it Whereas this one seems like he did. You see that? He, he's also realized how to make a picture stand out. So it's almost like, it's almost black and yellow, uh, but it it's, ends up being navy blue and a sort of yellowy green, right? And if you look at this, it's blue on blue. It's not really, uh, you're not going to fall off your chair. Uh, that hand is not terribly good either. But it's not a bad sketch. There, there it is. 
I'm just trying to show you how much he improves in a year. And it's because he, he worked really, really hard. He didn't just happen to paint a good picture. So this is the... Um, I'm going to just read this final letter and then and then we're going to deal with those two articles on on happiness right i agree that it is crispr okay so let's deal with um with this letter and then and then we'll yeah my dear theo thank you very much for your letter and the hundred franc note enclosed i think now that you are right in I think now that you are right in this idea of settling Bing's bill, and for this reason, I'm sending you back 50 francs. But I think it would be a mistake to have done with Bing. Ah, oh, no, on the contrary, I should not be surprised if Gorgon, like myself, wants to have some of those Japanese prints here. So do just as you think best about paying him the 90 francs of the deposit in full and then take up a full 100 francs worth later on, or else Bing will only replace the stuff represented by the 50 francs enclosed. If it were possible, seeing that the prints we have at our place are all beautiful, it would be better to take the whole stock. We get them so cheap and can give pleasure to so many artists with them that altogether we must keep what favor we have with old Bing. I myself went to his place three times on New Year's Day to settle up, but probably because of the stock taking, I found it shut up. Then a month later, before I left, I hadn't the money anymore, and I'd also given a fair number of Japanese things to Bernard when I exchanged with him. Only be sure to take the 300 Hukasai views of the Holy Mountain, as well as the pictures of Japanese life. See if we can have a quick look at that. I think um, it's this sort of thing. That's the sort of thing he's referring to. And if you look carefully, there's a similar dottiness in in this picture. You know, can you see those little dots? The, the, there's a similar aspect to that, and the sort of outlining in his art as well. It's it's turning a landscape into a caricature of itself, but it's not um, it's not simply simplifying the landscape. It's Simplifying it, but then adding something uh, as well. I mean, in terms of this, what you're seeing here, obviously the mountain isn't red. And so by making a volcano red like that, it, it gives a particular um, symbolism in a way. Okay, so then uh, it says... I, I myself cannot understand why you do not keep the lovely Japanese things at the Boulevard Montmartre. He would give you some of the best on commission, I'm sure. However, that's none of my business anyhow, but I am keen on our own private stock. All the same, stress the point that we make nothing on it, that we take a good deal of trouble about it, and finally that we have sometimes been the means of sending people to him. When I was in Paris, I always wanted to have a showroom of my own at a cafe. You know how that fell through. The exhibition of prints that I had at the tambourine influenced Anquitine and Bernard a good deal. And what a disaster that was. As for the trouble we took of the second exhibition in the room on Boulevard de Clichy, I regret it even less. Bernard sold his first picture there and Anquitine sold a study. So even Bernard has sold a picture. Then he says, I made an exchange with Gauguin. Uh, we all got something out of it. And then he continues to talk about money and, and prints and business. He says um, something about 
thinking that you were up against the Gorgon business and our sister's visit. So I will manage on that this month. And then he makes all of these references. So a lot of talk about money here. And then he says, by the way, about this book of Kassans, that's the ABCD of drawing. Um, he seems to really want that book. I wonder if he ever got, got hold of it. Um, it refers to Thomas's Daddy Thomas. He might pick up a few pennies from Daddy Thomas. Then again, Thomas might buy something from Gauguin if he knows the combination we have planned. If you pay the first deposit in full, we wouldn't. Why shouldn't we ask 200 francs commission instead of less? But on no account, cancel the deposit. So it's really, really just about money. Japanese art, decadent in its own country, takes root again amongst the French Impressionist artists. It is. It's practical value for artists that naturally interests me more than the trade in Japanese things. All the, all the same, the trade is interesting, all the more so because of the direction French art tends to take. Drop me a line to say if the drawings have reached you in good condition. Ever yours, Vincent. Okay, so uh, we'll continue our journey, it's going a lot slower than I thought it would, uh, with this letter. Um, 15th of July. So have you guys thought about it? Why are the Norwegians among the happiest people in the world? What do you think that is? Why are the Norwegians amongst the happiest people in the world? What do you guys say? They also say the Dutch are pretty happy. Uh, Cornelia says they drink a lot. Uh, Terry says their contribution to community. Well, there's a really good answer. Uh, Sarah says, simple living. Seclusion. Uh, Mel says, could it be because they really appreciate sunshine when they have it? Kristen says, lack of time. Okay, so Terry's right. The reason the Norwegians are so happy is because they've got a very strong sense of community. They care about one another. They care about their society. And the society obviously cares about them. Um, I remember as a young kid, um, I can't remember where I heard. I think I, I think it was in vocational guidance class of all places. We were studying um, Maslow or someone. And, and uh, I don't know, it came up with a they were talking about the greater good. And they were saying, when you take care of someone else, you take care of yourself, right? And I thought how profound that was, that when you, um, just by simply um, thinking of society's um, interests, so one way to think that way is to say, if you take what I'm doing and you multiply it by millions, is that going to be good for my fellow man? Alternately, my fellow man doing X, Y, Z, is that going to be good for me, right? And so in, in other words, that psychology where you think about someone besides yourself, but like almost you prioritize that, that person or, or the society, that's how you end up taking care of yourself. And that is a very Confucian attitude, which you see in Asia as well, um, where instead of being an individual and being in, independent, um, they are very much uh, focused on a co communal attitude. 
and I, I also found Koreans uh, to be very nice people, very welcoming. I found I found myself happier, uh, a lot happier in a way in Korea than I was in the UK. Um, because I, I also lived in the UK. So the, the answer to the question, what makes the Norwegians so much happier, even happier than the Danes and the, the Swedes, is that they have such a focus on society. Let's just have a look at this article. So they live in a kind of a gloomy, so if you had to go to Norway, you might say, well, this is pretty gloomy. It's always dark and it's cold or whatever, but it says here, um, Norway is ranked eighth globally um, in the World Happiness Report. So yes, the part that I've, I've highlighted. Um, Norway ranks exceptionally well because of its social support. Can you see that there? Social support. Um, so it um, also, it's not just social support. They also are more inclined to be, allow people their personal choices. Um, it says another area where the country excels is in freedom to make life choices. So can you imagine if you make a life choice, but you're also supported by your society? Society accepts you, and you use you accept your society. Now think about that in the context of things like shootings, right? Um, if your society likes you and you like your soci society, that's just not going to happen. Because people can make choices and they are allowed to make choices. And, right? Um, People care about one another. It's not like I just care about myself. Anyway, if you want to read this article, uh, there's not much more to it than that, but that is what it's about. Then uh, you can. Uh, is it all going to fit in there? Higher societal trust, yeah. Okay, and then um, now we're going to go into the next one. How do you find joy? How do you feel alive again? Right? And one one way, I think, intuitive way of addressing that is by getting a real sense of the seasons. The seasons remind you that, that things are changing. Either that summer's ending, you better get out there and make make use of the day. Or, well, spring's about to start, I, I need to get preparing for summer or whatever. Uh, I need to come out of hibernation. So how do you feel alive again? Be conscious of the season that you're in. And in a way, um, I'm just saying this is one thing you can do. Um, Try and align what you need to do today with the season you're in and at the time that you're in in terms of the season. That may be your moods and it may also be your your physical, um, what, what do you call it, uh, not biorhythms, but your the physical amount of resources you need to put into play. Uh, if it's the middle of winter, you can slow down and be cozy and you know, um, what's the word, almost slow down. Now that it's going to spring, now you can start to speed up again. So uh, I'm going to read just part of this article. I'll put a link to it in chat. I don't know if it'll fit if I do. Some, something tells me it won't. Yeah, it doesn't quite fit. Um, Will this fit? See if that will bring it up. Yeah, that should be enough. I, I don't know if you need to subscribe to the New York Times to read it, but 
Uh, I am a subscriber, so yeah. seasonal depression. Okay, okay. So um, this is. I'm just going to read part of the article. It all started with a post-it note. Go for a walk. It said, the no nonsense command perched in a prominent spot above Catherine May's desk. Catherine's a British author. She wrote a best-selling memoir, Wintering, about a fellow in difficult period of her life that it, she'd come across more hard times during the height of the uh, pandemic. She was bored, restless, burnt out. Her rich, uh, usual ritual, walking, had fallen away along with other activities that used to bring her pleasure, collecting pebbles, swimming in the sea, savoring a book. She said, there was nothing that made the world feel interesting to me. I felt like my head was kind of full and empty at the same time. Ever had that feeling? My head is kind of full and empty at the same time. Full of noise, full of chatter, but is there anything meaningful going on? And then she wrote a book, Enchantment. She described how a simple series of actions like writing that note, and the note is go for a walk, helped her to discover little things that filled her with wonder and awe, and in turn made her feel alive again. So there's one um, very simple answer to that. Um, notice the world around you. Notice in the same way Van Gogh notices leaves and buds and, and, and mosquitoes and um, all those little details. Uh, try and do the same. Try and notice the colors you see around you, how the colors are changing. The contrast of colors as well, uh, the, what do you call it, the textures. And um, yeah, so just notice what is around you. And so can you see the commit to noticing the world around you? That's one way to feel more alive and to feel happier. In other words, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to achieve more or improve your relationships or um, read a book. Simply make uh, an effort to simply notice what is around you. In other words, look beyond yourself. Look outside of yourself. Look at the world right next to you. And then she says, we have to find the humility to be open to experience every single day and allow ourselves to learn something. Right? Try to experience every single day as a day, you know, a day on its own that's part of a process. Let yourself go past those thoughts that tell you it's silly or pointless or a waste of time, or you're far too busy to possibly do this. You know, stop and look at the view. Stop and look at a very colorful flower, whatever it is. Stop and listen to a bird song. Stop and, you know, not stop and look at social media, but stop and look at something real in your uh, neighborhood. Stop and pet a, a dog that's walking by. She says, instead, give yourself permission to want that in the first place, to crave that contact with the sacred, or that feeling of being able to commune with something that's bigger than you are. She says, entering a state of wonder is akin to using a muscle. Put yourself in that mindset more often, and it gradually becomes easier. So in the beginning, you, you'll think, this is silly, and okay, so what? I'm looking at a flower, but over time you'll start to get a much deeper sense of the um, the miraculous, where you'll get a, a a more rooted sense of the thing that you are um, connecting to. Uh, Stephanie says, "I love cocoa and a warm fire and fresh snow." but only like it twice, and I'm good. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Yvonne says, I love to witness the seasons change. I walk every day, and it's different each day. So if I can give you guys a tip, uh, it's not definitely not rocket science, is I want you to try to be the first people to notice spring in your neck of the woods. And what I mean is it might be 
snow that's melting, so it might be a stream that is flowing more vigorously. It might be the first buds. It might be the first blossoms. It might be the uh, first tree out of all of them that, that suddenly blossoms. You sometimes see that. But I want you to um, look out for that, and then I want you to take a photo of that, and you can send it to me, and we can put it on the Team Peachtree community page. So in other words, it's registering spring. It's registering things that are about the return of light and warmth and um, color. Um, you might see a little yellow flower in um, coming out of a crack in the, in the sidewalk. Um, you might see a little pink um, star coming out of um, gravel. Um, all of that is just a sign. It, it might be spring rain clouds. Uh, it might be the first ripples of heat on a, on a road, on a highway. Um, in other words, I'm asking you to pay attention to those harbingers of spring, those the heralds of that something that that life is returning to the landscape and see if you, you notice that might be insects as well and so yeah so so take your take a photo of that sort of thing um without it being cliched without it being um uh yeah and then it you know send it to me and we'll put that on uh, and you'll see what will happen is other people noticing that will make you notice the same things they're noticing but then you start noticing things even more uh if you can't take a photo you can write a description of what you're seeing uh that suddenly it's warm or uh, i don't know whatever it is the wind the wind is blowing it shows a change of season whatever it is so she says entering a state of wonder is akin to using a muscle put yourself in that mindset more often and it gradually becomes easier give in to the fascination that you feel in everyday moments she talks about seeing the light dance across the surface of her coffee right and shall I read a little bit more? She says, ask yourself one simple question. And the question is, what soothes you? Right? And she says, it might be going for a walk or visiting an art museum. Maybe you enjoy watching the, the shifting clouds. And uh, she says here, we've told ourselves that everything needs to be so big. But actually, we can just breathe out and live quite small lives. Isn't that what Van Gogh is doing? Van Gogh alone doesn't have any money and he's actually kind of happy. He's kind of happy standing in a field being bitten by mosquitoes because he's really noticing all these small things around him. You can do the same thing. And um, I, I, I find that uh, having a dog really gets you in touch with your own... Um, your own sort of doggy self. You, you, you smell things in a way that you wouldn't. You notice things in a way that you wouldn't. So she says, um, every morning she goes outside and smells the air like a dog. <laughs> she notices the color of the sky and the way her skin feels against the cool air. I go for a lot of walks and I always notice every, um, every dusk is a different artwork from nature. The, the, every time the color is totally different, the clouds are totally different, um, and every time it's a surprise. It's like, wow, that, that I didn't expect that. And so it's quite interesting just to see what nature uh, serves up um, you know, in that respect. She says, contemplate and reflect in your own way. Um, do it because it feels good and and yeah so that's that's that and then there's one more article i want to bring to your attention which is quite interesting the eiffel tower may have inspired van gogh's the starry night 
And if you look at this, this Cyprus on the left here, isn't this Cyprus, in a way, his Eiffel Tower is saying, uh, this is much prettier than the Eiffel Tower. It's like this incredible tower above this little town. And wasn't he saying, because he painted this the same time, um, story, he painted Story Night the same time of the, the uh, World Fair. Wasn't he trying to kind of criticize this? Uh, where is it? Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong article. Uh, this one. So through that picture, wasn't he trying to criticize this? That. That uh, you, you don't need metal towers. Uh, and, you know, you need what you really want, what is really beautiful and is even more impressive is that. And is, isn't he right? And maybe that's the reason why Story Night is actually so momentous, is because he was trying to challenge that kind of monument, right? Um, and then it says here, um, where are those complaints? Just say something about how many people were. Oh, yeah. So on February 14, 1887, a month after construction of the Eiffel Tower began, 40 writers, that's 1887, signed a letter published in the paper saying, calling it a gigantic black factory chimney and an odious column of bolted metal. Although Van Gogh did not sign the letter, who believes that the artist would have agreed with the article's sentiment? And so he writes, Van Gogh's story night is nature's and history's response to Eiffel's bombastic shuddering metal monster that sought to surpass the Egyptians and besmirch Paris, all wrote in the article. I just think it's an interesting idea. I'd, I, I'd never thought of that as a cypress tree in terms of this being a symbolic protest against the Eiffel Tower. Um, it's a very interesting idea, whether it's true or not. Do you guys agree? That's interesting. Does your schnauzer know when you about to go on a long trip? Gwen says, I didn't realize when I got a small doggy just how vulnerable they are to everything. Okay. Terry says, uh, last year my husband set up a hawk cam and we watched the babies hatch on our big screen. See, that is quite amazing. Well, can you share any of those like screen grabs with us, Stephanie? been five years they've come back to the same nest okay i've got swallows that uh well i've got a swallow's nest i don't know if it's always the same swallows that come back um okay elise says i think that's worth exploring further if that was a protest uh stephanie says interesting interesting okay yeah so uh Remember when uh, there was a bit of a mishap in the live? I did about 14 minutes before I realized something was wrong. Um, this is what I really wanted to sort of share with you. Um, anyway, so, so you know, that's my spiel uh, for today. Are you getting a sense that we're really getting to know Van Gogh really well, where you can actually tell you know exactly where he's coming from? And, and, and of course, that is exactly what's to be expected after 300 letters, 400 letters, you, you getting to know really this person. And that's part of the um, 
the, the, the great gift of his letters is that how many people that you don't really know can you get to know this well because they put themselves on paper? Not many. And so um, this is quite extraordinary because it's a very popular artist, but it's, it's also someone that most people, even despite his popularity, despite his uh, fame, most people still misunderstand him. And I find that to be, to be frank, unacceptable. It's unacceptable that you can't know who he is when all you've got to do is read his letters. Uh, there's no mystery. That's who he is. Um, you don't need 900 letters to get to know him. You, maybe you need 20 or 30 or 50, but there they are. And 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 um, in the same way that we're going to get to know Van Gogh even better through these terrible trials he's about to go through um, and how he responds to them, that's the kind of level of intimacy you actually need in true crime where you say, this is a really, this is a fully fledged person. You can't just say, I've seen his face, I know his name, now I know who it is. No. Um, you've got to really make an effort to get into their shoes. And a lot of those folks in true crime make absolutely no effort at that. You know, it's like, who committed the crime in Idaho? His name is, uh, it looks like his name is Brian Koberger. He has his picture. Well, now I know who he is. I know his name and I've got his face. That's who committed the crime. No, that's not who committed the crime. That's just his name and his face. The why is a very, very deep um, story about who somebody is. And it's not a very easy thing. It's something that takes a lot of time, intuition, um, knowing a lot of different facts, and also knowing how, they, how those dynamics work together. And that's why Van Gogh's letters are really good practice to get to know very, very deeply a person, um, how they feel about all sorts of different things, um, from the cerebral things to the little petty little things. That is what makes up a person. Just as you are a very complicated machine of thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, hopes, prayers, so is everybody else. And when we lose that capacity to see those details, um, we, be, we, we become careless and reckless, and, and, and we, we shouldn't. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you for that as well. I, I really um, feel very appreciative uh, when you know we at this point and and you know two two hours 15 minutes and there are 39 people in chat i actually feel really appreciative i think there might be other creators who look at it and go what garbage what nonsense how boring whatever but to me the fact that a classroom of you are here pretty much every episode that to me is a success in itself so i really do appreciate that I find it interesting and I'm, I'm, it's, it's great that I can share it with you guys as well. To me, it's very meaningful and uh, it's going to be sad when it's over. And um, But we, we certainly do still have quite a lot to go through. Zircon says, don't forget to like. Okay. Yeah, so we are at 48, uh, episode 48, and I anticipate we may have another 25 or so. Uh, I'm not going to be doing the last sum in, in Orvez because we've done it. Um, but yeah, we're going to be doing the, from here it really gets interesting, from here to the ear incident, so from here to the end of the year is a very interesting period, and then the whole the whole of 1889 is a very interesting here as well. Not easy going though. It's it's filled with pain, heartache, tragedy, suffering, difficulty, but then also Starry Night, also this. In the middle of all of that despair, this.
And so that's kind of the journey we're on here is how do we get from this Vincent van Gogh that paints some horrible stuff to that Vincent van Gogh, that, that one? How do we get from here to there? Um, Cornelius says these sessions are prices. I so appreciate them. And good, good, uh, really good to have you. Such a nice group of people. Helena says, can you tell us how Patreon works? This is a separate app. Um, my advice is just Google it. It's basically what what can you say Patreon is? It's it's, a, it's basically a blog that is behind a paywall. And that's where a lot of us have conversations with one another. And yeah, um, yeah. There's just a bit more, there's some behind the scenes of what I'm thinking and doing. And um, yeah, it's just, it's another way of getting to know this community. So, Jalsi says, I love Story Night so much. Yeah. It is, right? It definitely is. Uh, thanks a lot, Mel. Thank you. Uh, Gwen says, will we read the letter he writes to Paul Gauguin after he leaves the, the asylum? Um, yes. And also, he writes quite a few letters to Paul Gauguin after he loses his ear. Um, and those are definitely, that's where your true crime antenna need to be up a little bit. What's he actually saying? Elise says, I appreciate Van Gogh so much more already. And you know what it is? Because he, he, his struggle was real. His struggle was much greater than most people endure. And, and he, 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 he kind of happily endured it, right? Okay. Okay, so that is it from me. Um, uh, greetings from a fairly cold uh, South Africa. It's, 10 to 5 in the morning. I, I've got a couple of things I need to do. Um, but thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, uh, Mods, Stephanie, uh, Terry, Iceland, I don't think, joined us on this occasion. But if you're watching this on on uh, replay, then then uh, uh, hi, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Kristen, Yvonne, everyone, thanks a lot for being here. Helena. Deborah, I think this time maybe suited you a little bit better in Australia. By the way, Terry says, I did my homework already today on a hike in Muir Woods. I thought of each one of you. Cool. Mel says, I, lo I love knowing that hummingbirds keep coming back to my hummingbird feeder. Those little birds are my family. I must say um, one way that I think is just so intuitive and, and natural for to be soothed, to be healed, to be restored, to be um, to get yourself in sync with with you and with the world is communing with nature, just seeing nature for what it is. Just that. You don't need to do anything, achieve anything. There doesn't have, need to be anything special. Just paying attention to nature can really be a soothing and restorative um, experience and the more in tune you are with nature the more in tune you are with yourself and that's going to make you a more effective balanced healthy happy person just that cool i hope you found this a uh, worthwhile episode I i've enjoyed being here with you uh thanks a lot for voting and um, i think that's it kristen says please go out there and look for things that are new and remember to send me pictures and I'll put some of them up on, on the community page. Thanks, guys. Oh, Josie says, I received bad news today. Thank you for cheering me up. Hope you're going to be okay, Josie. What, 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 what's happening?
I don't know if you maybe don't want to maybe talk about it, but uh, you, our thoughts are with you. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, so it's still out there, eh? it's still circulating. Well, you are letting us know maybe that's going to um, help someone uh, perhaps avoid it. Anyway, um, our thoughts are with you. Hopefully your mother's going to be okay. Keep us appraised of whatever happens there. Um, you might also want to speak to Stephanie. Stephanie knows um, more than most about that. Oh, wow, that's okay. Um, you, you should take a picture of it and send it to us as well, like in your lounge or wherever it is. Okay, well, our thoughts are with um, with Josie and then also with um, Nisi, De Denise. Um, yeah, yeah, we are, we are, we all have our seasons where the hardship is is worse than everyone else, right? But uh, times do change. When he says hi to Timmy, cool. Okay, guys, thanks a lot for joining me here. I'm going to be off. Um, see you guys next time. I'm not sure when that'll be. It uh, might be a couple of days from now. So look out for episode 49. We will continue with uh, the mid-July onwards. Take care, guys. Sleep tight. Uh, keep warm. Uh, keep Stay safe. And, um, yeah, Josie's mom's definitely in our thoughts. We'll... Find out next time we speak um, how if hopefully things will have improved. Uh, anyway, we'll hold thumbs and um, keep in in, in uh, our thoughts. Good night, everyone. Take care. Ciao.